So thanks everybody for joining today. This is our second to last Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers webinar in our winter series. Really excited today to welcome a whole host of wonderful, knowledgeable folks today, um, all from the University of Vermont in different capacities. We're gonna start with Vic Izzo, who is a professor in the Department of well, Plant and Soil Science becoming something named differently. <laughs> and also a, an amazing entomologist who offers a lot of support to extension and farmers. And then Cheryl Frank Sullivan and Margaret Skinner from the Entomology Lab at UVM, amazing resources for all things pest and um, greenhouse related. And then Anne Hazelrig um, from the Plant Diagnostic Clinic. So I am going to hand it over to Everybody, um, feel free. There's not a lot of participants, so if you want to unmute yourself with a question or um, pop it in the chat, either way works fine for us. So thank you, Vic. Sure. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, everyone, for joining this. I, I really love this series, and I'm, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be a part of it um, on this side rather than being on the, the viewing side and kind of extracting information from all, all the information that has been shared over the last few years when I'm always tuning in. Um, and as Becky said, I work at UVM. I'm part of the Agriculture, Landscape, and Environment Department, which is going to be the new name of Plant Soil Science Department. And I'm entomologist by training, but I'm, I'm actually more of an evolutionary ecologist in many ways. And we're going to be talking today kind of as a, just the beginnings of a Colorado potato beetle educational program where primarily this is just going to be an info, like short information session about the Colorado potato beetle, um, some of the things that maybe you don't know or maybe things you already know, and with an opportunity to be a part of some of our programming and some of our research. So, and this is done um, under auspices also of the Institute for Agroecology, which is located here at the University of Vermont and within the College of Ag and Life Sciences. So, and if you need to contact me, it's really easy to remember my email is just vizzo. So I want to start off um, with some Colorado potato beetle facts, um, fun facts that maybe people don't know, and it does kind of inform a little bit about um, kind of how the Colorado potato beetle interacts in our agri-existence here in Vermont. Um, firstly, the Colorado potato beetle is actually not the Colorado potato beetle. It's actually the Mexican potato beetle. It's kind of a misnomer. Um, its ancestral range is actually in central Mexico. It met the potato when the potato came through came through the Andes, it, well, the origins of the potato in the Andes, went over to Europe, and then it was brought to the U.S. from European settlers. And meanwhile, the Colorado potato beetle moved up northward um, on kind of settlers that were moving, also European settlers, but, but Spanish settlers that were moving up northward. And it met somewhere in the Midwest where it fell in love with potato and it hopped off its, its ancestral host plant, which was found in Colorado. Um, and so that's why they called it Colorado potato beetle because they saw it feeding on its ancestral host and on the cultivated host. It's not, and interestingly enough, it's not a pest in Mexico. There's nowhere, I, I went around mes Mexico sampling Colorado potato beetle throughout most of the central part of the valley and not one farmer identified it as a pest anywhere. And I actually found it on a wild plant, but not in the potato fields right next door. So kind of really interesting in how there are some natural enemies and, and mechanisms that control the plant, uh, control the pest in those aggregate systems where its origins are. So. It's also the kind of the most devastating defoliator of potatoes and other solanums, cultivated solanums in the whole world, but it's not found in the Southern Hemisphere. It covers over 60 million kilometers, square kilometers in the over three continents, but it's it's not a pest in anywhere. It's not found in the Southern Hemisphere, which is really interesting, considering that that's where the origins of potato are. And here in Vermont and in other parts of the Northeast, um, Colorado potato beetle actually prefer eggplant to potato. Um, and actually perform just as well on eggplant as they do on potato. Um, and so a lot of growers might be noticing that in Vermont, they're like, oh, I always get them worse on potato, worse on eggplant than I do potato. We've done a bunch of preference studies and we've seen that they do prefer eggplant in general. Um, and then of course, because eggplant has a slower growing, um, the plants don't grow back as easily as potatoes do. They tend to be more of a pest if you are planning on growing eggplant. The other thing that I want to point out is that we're not really going to spray ourselves out of Colorado potato beetle. Um, this is actually just some data showing that uh, that little graph right there that shows those are all of the chemicals that Colorado potato beetle 
has developed resistance to. Um, and if you look on the y-axis, you see that those are years until resistance occurred. And the vast majority of all those chemicals that you see here have uh, developed the first resistance or identified resistance first um, less than 20 years, and many of them less than 10 years. And so it's a pretty, it's an evolutionary marvel. And the more times we develop these chemicals to defend against um, the cognitive to be able to, the quicker it actually gets at developing resistance to them. And to give you some example of the two primary chemical controls that are used for cognitive to in this region, metoclopid, which was developed in 1991, it was eight years um, in just in all across all insect species, the average years to resistance was just eight years. And for CBB is around six years with the metoclopid resistance. And same thing with spinosad. It's about eight years. It was developed in 1997 and we saw resistance cropping up in eight years across a whole bunch of insect species. And then CBB, we actually saw it um, around six to eight years um, for spinosad. And um, in general, across all chemical controls, CBB, on average de develops resistance to those chemical controls in 22 generations. Um, so it's a very quick um, evolution for resistance. So we're, we're just simply, we can't just use chemicals to control for um, octatabule. So just to, you're all in my way. Just go quickly go over the life cycle and the seasonal behavior that's gonna help inform controlling Colorado potato, Colorado potato beetle. The first thing is that you wanna think about when you're looking for or implementing an IPM program is, what are the life stages that an insect has? Because some insects go through four life stages, some go through three, and some don't go through perhaps even one. Um, and then where do they spend that stage? Are they staying on the plant that you're trying to protect? Do they go somewhere else? And then do they overwinter here? Um, so that's a really important way to develop um, a plan, some sort of IPM program. So Carob Tata beetle emerges in the, in the spring um, from their overwintering areas, often the margins of, of fields on you know, kind of where often when we have tree lines that are kind of in between your field and some sort of margin. Um, females and males emerge, they mate, and then females lay about 300 to 600 eggs over a one month um, lifespan, laying about 10 to 30 eggs per um, egg mass. Um, then they spend about four to nine days on the undersides of plants. They hatch after about 10 days, for like a four to nine days, like I said before. And then we have about two to three weeks where the larva will go through three molts or four stages. We call them instars. So they have four instars. After they get to that fourth instars, after that fourth instar, after molting three times, they will crawl down or fall down to the soil and they'll pupate for um, 10 to 14 days in the soil right below the plants. And that all kind of ends up being about four to eight weeks, depending on temperature, because temperature drives um, how quickly these insects develop and most insects develop. So anywhere from four to eight weeks for a single generation of Colorado potato beetle. And so that leaves us with about two generations um, per year. Um, and what essentially happens, at least in Vermont, and sometimes three, depending on the temperature, um, and adults emerging with only 14 to 15 hours of day length, which is puts us like late July, early August. Those adults that emerge out of the soil with in August, essentially, they do not lay eggs, or they generally do not lay eggs. Um, they begin to start to look for overwintering sites. And I, for a lot of people, I don't think they realize that that's the time when we are seeing a lot of carotidated beetle migrate to their overwintering sites. And they'll, they'll burrow down into the soil, and they burrow down anywhere from like 10 to 30 centimeters, but sometimes even deeper into the soil, depending on how much they've fed upon on your plants and they have enough energy. Um, another important thing that I wanted to touch upon is that if we're going to be um, implementing any IPM program, we want to be <clears throat> using scouting techniques that are effective. And, and the primary way in which many people scout Colorado potato beetle often is just simply looking under the undersides of leaves, because this is this is not upside down. This is actually the picture I was taken with the Colorado potato beetle female laying its egg on the underside of a potato plant. You can see that's about 30 eggs right there. So that's a really easy way to check, just checking underneath um, leaves. But sometimes that's not as viable when you're constantly on your tractor and having to get the tractor and look underneath the leaves. Um, and so there is a degree day model um, that helps you kind of get some idea of what stage that your um, population of Colorado potato beetle might be. Uh, and this is also going to be really, really helpful to inform what type of, of treatment you might be able to use against Colorado potato beetle. So in general, BT, 
um, which there is going to be a re-release of the Trident, which I'm hearing. I got news that maybe they're trying to, they're going to re-release a formulation again in some states in the Northeast that I got wind of from someone telling me this recently. Um, so, but if you're going to be using BT, it's really only effective during the trip. <clears throat> so you want to make sure that you're, you're using at the right time. And so you can use this degree day model about 185 degree days to identify when that, um, when the population is in the, around, roughly around the first instar. Of course, you could just look around to see what they're, but the first instar are really, really small. They often look like little black dots. Um, and then of course, as you can see here, um, as you get into the larger instars or the larger larvae, it's really not effective to use BT. And you're gonna be looking at more conventional insecticides or spinosad also, which have to be ingested, of course, um, and ingested in enough amount that would um, kill the organism. And then the other piece that I want to point out when we're talking about Colorado potato beetle is when to manage Colorado potato beetle. Now, there's been a lot of research looking at how tolerant uh, potato plants are to uh, damage or defoliation that will actually lead to a loss in yields. And so I think this is a really cool graph right here that shows essentially that you can withstand quite a bit. So what this is, this is the, the maximum reported damage without any yield loss um, in research over, I think is, I think it's in the Northeast. I can't remember exactly. But, um, and you can see here, when you have the smaller plants, even though they tend to be smaller, they tend to, as long as you're not getting, getting completely defoliated, they can withstand quite a bit of damage without having much yield loss. Um, but we'll suggest to growers that if your plants are starting, you're starting to see flowers in your potato plants, that's one the time when you really want to be paying attention to how much how how much pressure you're getting. Because if you're getting a lot of pressure in that time, you're going to see the highest amount of, of impact on your yield. And especially if you're seeing damage on stems. Um, and so, because potato plants begin tuberization a little before and while blooming, it's it's actually day length dependent. Most potato plants, except for your day neutral potatoes, like your early potatoes, like Norland Reds and stuff like that. Um, and like I said before, the blooming period is the easiest way to determine the most susceptible life stage of your potato plants and what you really want to be protecting your plants. And so that flowering period often happens when the second generation that, that is emerging out of the soil. Um, and that's why we always talk about like the second generation is what you really gives us the most damage, but it's really the most damage that leads to the least, the most yield loss. Um, and so plants generally though can be pretty tolerant of up to 20% defoliation across all life stages, but really you wanna really control them during the blooming period of potato. And um, I don't even know how much time I got. I got two minutes, perfect. So um, some of the cultural and mechanical controls that we've been using or people in the region have been using, crop rotations um, have been really effective if you have the land base. For eggplant, insect exclusion netting can be really effective. Um, if you're making sure that those, those insect exclusion netting, there's nothing getting in, so making sure those sides are really kind of tightly um, secured to the ground. Um, spring trap crops also have shown some success and even some fall trap crops. So planting some potatoes early in the season, allowing them to grow up before you're planting your main crop, and then basically either flaming them or destroying them somehow, um, use maybe a pesticide on it, whatever it may be. Um, as you saw, I think in a previous uh, webinar, there's a really diverse array of implements that farmers are like, there's all these different implements you can use that knock off um, Colorado potato beetle into buckets and stuff like that. Um, and then what's been kind of a relatively old, but tried and true for some growers and still swear by it, of doing trenches around potato fields or around fields where you're planting potatoes, other slonums and filling them with water. Um, and then recently, which we have a research project on, delayed planting has become really popular in the region. There are some biological controls that are found naturally occurring in the region. Um, spiny soldier bug you might see feeding upon um, cholera potato uh, two-spotted stink, stink bug. Both of them are kind of actively feeding upon larvae and adults. And then there is a, um, a fungus, govaria, um, that also can lead to quite a bit of control if you're applying it through as mycotrol, which is kind of the commercial application of it, or if you're having some of it native in the soil or native somewhere around. Chemical controls, as I said before, Trident um, has been relatively successful. Um, it just, its formulation isn't very shelf stable in, in the past. So it's been pulled from the, the, from, uh, the shelves and then returned, pulled and returned. And it sounds like they have another formulation that is 
um, being tested or looking, looking to be tested in the Northeast right now. Um, and trust, so that really leaves us organic growers, mostly are using spinosad as their primary way of controlling um, uh, cow potato beetle, which of course leads to resistance. Um, and then imidacloprid is the primary workhorse for conventional. Um, and then I just wanna end um, with, we are currently in the midst of a delayed planting study um, where we're testing two to four weeks after typical planting date. Um, and we have a field trial at the UVM Horticultural Research Farm, where we're looking for farm partners that are looking, that are willing to compare two dates, their normal date, and then planting some potatoes somewhere else nearby within, on their farm, um, that basically just comparing the, the pressure that we see when we're planting two to four weeks later than you normally would. And we have partners already in Vermont and Maine, but we always want more. If you're interested, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Becky, or if some of you might know Caleb, um, reach out to Caleb, we're all working on this project together. And then if you don't wanna do that, but you wanna be a part of our educational program, there's a link here. I don't know if the links, I don't think anyone can really click on a link, but I can share the link with Becky and Becky, or I could share it in the, the chat. Um, and then really it's just giving all of our information for our research trials, um, getting some information about what you're currently doing, and then using all that to help inform growers about what people are doing for Colorado potato beetle and how we can best support them. All right, questions? Yes. Thanks, Nick. We could um we could spend a whole hour diving into Colorado potato beetle, but that was a really awesome, succinct summary in a short amount of time. And I, um yeah, definitely want to give a plug for that project. It's a pretty low... Um, low commitment on a grower part to to join. I, I don't see any questions right now, so we'll carry on. But if people have them coming up, put them in the chat. And yeah, Vic, if you could put that survey in the chat and then I'll send it out when I, I'm going to send out a whole um, evaluation of the webinars and it'll be in that as well. So thank you so much, Vic. Thank you. Cheryl and Margaret, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Cheryl Frank Sullivan, and I'm here with Margaret Skinner from the Entomology Research Lab. And this is kind of like a two-part talk, where first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, scheduling biocontrol releases, and then Margaret's going to talk a little bit about um, how to submit specimens for the proper identification of insect pests. All right, part one. So as you're transitioning to your summer crops, uh, you really wanna remember that prevention is essential and you wanna strive to start to stay clean. So there's a whole lot of strategies that can help reduce pest pressure and make the environment less suitable for pest establishment. I'm not gonna cover all of these just for the sake of time, but for today's tunnel pest purposes, um, the few of the tips are highlighted in yellow that you, know, you can try out this season. Um, so some of those are keeping track of the pests that you find during routine scouting and identifying the pests correctly. It's really good to train all of your staff what some key pests look like and where to find them. And you wanna to try to use biocontrol preventatively rather than reactively and consider using things like trap plants to detect pests and habitat plantings to help attract and sustain natural enemies. So there's a lot of pests to keep an eye out for, and this is just kind of a basic review of some of the common ones in tunnels. Um, there are several cutworms that crawl around at night and strip off plants at the base during the early season. Uh, for these, it's good to scout at dawn and dusk and to dig around to snip plants because the caterpillars hide in that top few inches of soil. And then later on in the summer, it's the horn worms that defoliate uh, tomato plants. And then the telltale signs of those other than defoliation are those huge frass uh, or poop piles that they leave behind. And then there's several different uh, beetles like flea, cucumber, and potato beetles. And then there's those uh, smaller pests that often go unnoticed until their populations are robust enough to cause extensive damage like thrips, aphids, white flies, and mites. Um, for uh, more specific information about these pests and their management, uh, check out uh, the High Tunnel Pests Old and New talk from last year that I gave with Anna Wallingford, and that has a review of, of all of these as well as their natural enemies that are used for their control. Um, the good news here is some of these larger pests like the flea and cucumber beetles, um, you can anticipate those and exclude them using row cover or by screening. But for these smaller ones, they tend to be a bit trickier and it's kind of a 
all hands on deck approach to deal with those. So this season, let's not wait around for the dreaded aphid apocalypse or sit around and dread dealing with the spider mite madness. Um, don't be, don't be frightened. Um, so the chances of these sorts of outbreaks really can be reduced through diligent scouting and with a little help from your parasitic and predatory friends if you employ them at the right time of the season and provide them with some incentives to stick around. So this is just a hypothetical example here, but if you're say a grower that's had historical issues with spider mites and thrips on cucumbers, there's a lot you can do. So before placing the plants in the house, you can use things like bush bean trap plants throughout, and you can plant them throughout kind of before you transplant or along the edges that tend, to, and these tend to be really, really attractive to spider mites and thrips. They, they really like that new fresh bean vegetation. And this really indicates how good of a job that you did cleaning the tunnel um, in the fall, um, assuming that this was fallow over winter. And when they show up, it can actually help you um, establish that appropriate level of biocontrols right from the get-go. So if these bean plants become infested, you can just throw them away and pop a new seed in the ground. And these really do work the best when they're young and tender. So if the house has that history of spider mites, they're gonna be hiding um, in the ground near debris and especially around the posts and the walls of the tunnels, because that tends to be where the soil is less, less disturbed. So you can introduce a soil dwelling predatory mite called stratiolalaps um, around the wall areas. And those will help uh, get at those overwintering mites. They're hanging out peacefully where the soil is left undisturbed. So they also eat thrips pupa, which are that soil dwelling stage um, of thrips that tend to be overlooked. So after transplanting uh, the crops, the foliar dwelling predatory mites can be used. So there's a lot of different species of these foliar dwelling mites available, and they all do a better job on certain pests over others. And they don't always play nice with each other if released together. I don't want to get in the weeds here by talking about all the different types, but it really depends on the crop and the time of year and your primary target pest. So the things, um, those are the things that your biocontrol supplier um, are supposed to help you figure out. So one example would be a uh, cucumerist, and that's a generalist mite, and it feeds on thrips, spider mites, and pollen when prey is absent. Californicus is another, but that has a strong preference for mites over thrips, and it'll also feed on pollen. And these types of mites are available as a loose product that you can sprinkle on the plants, but they also come in these slow release or systems, they're called sachets or breeding systems. And these are longer lasting. Um, and that's because pollen can be kind of low and scattered on crops like cucumber and tomato. And these mites really need um, a source of pollen and a way to reproduce in, in the absence of prey. So they're ready to roll when those uh, pests show up. So um, you can use the bug aureus and aureus is a naturally occurring natural enemy. And it really doesn't show up in large numbers until later on in the summer, but you can buy them early and you can give them something flowering like alyssum habitat plants. And that's gonna boost them by providing them pollens and nectars and maybe some other attractive pests um, to sustain them you know, in, in the absence. So it's good to get them going um, early, early as you can. So a lot of these are like more of the generalist natural enemies, but if you're out there scouting and you realize that oh, you had some of these in here and they really didn't do their job. Um, if you find some hot spots, you can, you can start using more specialist predators. And one of those specialists is a fly called Feltiella and it's a midge and they specialize on spider mites. So they'll fly around and they'll lay eggs and the maggots will eat the spider mites. The maggots are the immature flies. And if you also find some hot spots, you can use Persimilis. And Persimilis tends to be the kind of the go-to predator on plants like tomatoes and cucumbers. And that's because a lot of these other predatory mites aren't really as effective because it has to do with the leaf trichomes because they tend to be um, really, really hairy. And a lot of predatory mites don't really do as well. Uh, but you have something like a specialist like the Persimilis, they really want to get at those mites and they, they're a little bit bigger than the other. So they tend to do a little bit better. And, you know, by specialists, it means they're only going to eat the spider mites. They're not really interested in other prey. So they're really going to focus on those spider mite hot, hot spots. Okay. So timing is everything. 
again, here's another example. So suppose you pulled all your aphid infested greens and planted a mixture of summer crops. You really wanna make sure that you get those aphids identified because if you use a lot of parasitic wasps as a preventative, a lot of them are host specific and they tend to attack certain aphid species. So in summer um, or late spring, releasing aphidious parasitic wasps as a preventative is a good idea after you identify the aphids. And then you can also release a fly called aphidolites and, a and that predatory bug again, aureus. And you can get those in their early season, especially knowing if you had those aphid problems going into the season. So these will really help reduce the chances of that aphid apocalypse midsummer, just because you got that timing right. So if you find aphid hotspots kind of down the road, you can use things like lace wings. And these need a lot of prey to stick around like lady beetles do. And the lace wings will tend to eat themselves if you have nothing for them. So they're not really something that you should be using as a, as a preventative. So scouting really is still critical to ensure that releasing these natural enemies are doing their job because it dictates if you have to order more um, just before you, know, you reach that tipping point where you realize that you're getting satisfactory suppression um, from your preventative use of biocontrols. Okay, so the easiest way to prepare for releasing biocontrols because it can sometimes get really daunting and it's like, oh my God, there's so many options. I don't know what to use and I don't know how to visualize this um, is make yourself a schedule and get it down somehow so you can really visualize the way your season is going. So you can make this basic template in a program like Excel. I mean, that's just one way. And these can act as reference points that can be tweaked over time. So this is just an example of what that could look like based on a date, um, based on date or week and preferred natural enemy broken down by pest. So if you work with a biocontrol supplier, many will or should assist you with setting up a preventative release schedule that's gonna arrive right at your tunnel door so you don't have to forget to order. Because let's face it, like everybody gets busy. And if you miss that critical timing um, to release the natural enemies, things can get out of hand really quickly. So every operation is different and scheduling these releases is really based on your own problem history, your crop mixtures and how much money you wanna spend. Because you know it can be expensive using biocontrols. Um, so that's really up to you. But at the very least, some of the natural enemies that can work for you when you get too busy with other things should be considered, especially if you have these history of these pest issues repeating itself. So there's a lot of uh, biocontrol suppliers out there. Shop around and find the one that works for you and will help you um, set you up for pest management success. And now on to Margaret. So uh, the question that we all have whenever uh, it takes a lot of time to do something is why bother to do anything? And identification of, of an insect pest or an insect that you have in your greenhouse or high tunnel or whatever, um, getting it identified uh, really matters. And Cheryl talked briefly about uh, differences in uh, the effectiveness of different biological control agents, uh, depending on the aphid species, for example. So you really need to know what species of aphid you have before you decide what you're going to order. Um, <clears throat> sometimes the insects that you see that you think are pests may not be pests at all. And one of the examples is a fiddleides. This is a midge that in the larval stage um, attacks aphids. Uh, if you have a large population of aphids, it will, they will reproduce very quickly. And then you may see flocks of these aphidolides adults flying around. You might think they're fungus gnats when actually they are uh, the predatory mite that you really want in your greenhouse. So sometimes it's really important uh, to be able to distinguish these different things. Okay, next. <clears throat> uh, and also, ideally, if you're going to be ordering natural enemies from a biological control supplier, the first thing they will ask is, what species of aphid do you have? And you will speed up the process if you get them identified initially. Okay, so the easiest thing to do is to take a picture. Um, for me, as one of the people that often gets these uh, insects or specimens or whatever, um, <clears throat> a picture really doesn't work very well if you're just taking it with your 
a regular camera or even a camera on a uh, cell phone. To identify a, an aphid to species, you often need to see uh, these little cornicles that are um, on the top of the head and the way it's shaped uh, and other key characteristics that you just can't tell with a picture that is either blurry like this one or even this, which is a little bit better, it still is not uh, close enough to be able to see what it is. So that's why uh, it's, if, if you really care about uh, IPM and knowing what's going on in your operation, it's worth investing in a computer linked microscope. Uh, they aren't that expensive. They're between 20 to maybe a hundred dollars. This shows a grower that's using it. The, the pictures that she takes it are just incredible. Uh, and it isn't that costly and it provides a, a good uh, record for the future. Okay, next. <clears throat> so uh, step two is you got to take a sample. When you're taking a sample, it's really important that you also start thinking, how serious is this infestation? Because these are the questions that we're going to ask you. Again, whether it's me or Ann Hazelrig or your biological control supplier um, or any person that's helping you with pest management. So you have to figure out how widespread is the infestation? How many actual insects are there in an area? Uh, determine what crops are, are affected and then collect two to five infested leaves or whatever the, the plant part that's damaged. Don't just take one little leaf and think that that's enough. Uh, it's important to take them potentially from different parts of uh, the field or the greenhouse. Um, <clears throat> if possible, in some cases, it's better to take the whole plant and the roots because there may be stuff going on uh, underneath the ground. <clears throat> if they're aphids, you need to get big ones uh, and get ones ideally with wings. Uh, to identify an aphid, you have to have the adult stage. Not all adult aphids have wings, but if they have wings, you know they're adults. Um, so you see here, there's some a lot of little ones. We can't identify those to species. They really need to be big. Um, if they're thrips, which is another common pest you might run into, you have to have adults because uh, we can't identify larvae at all um, to species. So once you take the samples, you need to keep those samples in a cool, dark place, but not in a refrigerator. Okay, so then the next thing you do, after you've collected some of those things and you got a sense of where the problem is, then you call Anne. Now, this is primarily for um, people in Vermont, and there may be other people on this call that um, are from other states, and each state has a plant diagnostic clinic that you can uh, go to to get uh, assistance. Um, the How much it costs really varies from uh, state to state to some extent. So you just need to call them up. The call is free, so it's always worth making the call. Usually, if it's a bug, um, and will and isn't and it isn't obvious what it is, she will consult with others as needed. That might be Cheryl or me or Vic or other people that are specialists in the particular area. Mm -hmm. And after she's talked to all of these people, and we've maybe it's based on a picture, um, then it may be necessary to uh get a to get provide a live specimen so you need to once you collect those specimens you need to keep them until you decide what's needed okay next slide okay so you got the leaf sample here on the left and you can see some aphids are kind of falling out and that's fine um, you're going to want to put that into a sealed plastic bag including the damaged leaves so here's a picture of uh uh, the leaves all ready to go. Uh, sometimes if you're going to include soil, um, wrap the, the root ball in plastic, or if you're going to send a whole plant pot, um, cover that all in some kind of saran wrap or something. Um, <clears throat> if you don't, then the soil gets all over the place and it 
makes it very difficult to uh, see what's going on with the insect. Um, don't add any water because that just tends to um, make for a wet mess. Um, you should really mark the bag with the date uh, that you sampled it and where in your operation you actually uh, took the sample. Okay, then you, with that sample, you need to put it in a crush proof container with packing material. And this is what you want down here on the left. You don't want to even put it in uh, uh, one of those bubble wrap envelopes because they will, when they go through the um, mail system that just crushes everything. <clears throat> you need to include some key information, which involve, includes, <clears throat> excuse me, the affected crop, your name and mailing address, an email address, and a telephone number. Now, um, there is a, a form that you can get from the uh, Plant Diagnostic Lab uh, website to fill out. That's the best way to do it. <clears throat> And just so you have it, just so you recognize, uh, as commercial growers, it's really important to us that we get you answers as quickly as possible. My goal always is to reply within 24 hours, whether it's a weekend day or a weekday. Um, and so getting information like your telephone number and, or an email address is really important because oftentimes we need more information than what we have on the piece of paper. Okay, again, we respond within 24 hours. Um, our goal is to identify it to species because we know how important that is. After we've determined what the species is, we also provide information on the pest biology, which Cheryl talked a little bit about, and Vic too, about how important it is to know how long it takes for a population to increase in size. So you really need to know the pest biology. And then we supply references for various management options that you have available. So this is our goal. Um, and it's a great service that is worth taking advantage of. Thanks, Margaret. And that was a great segue into this next slide. So to find a lot of those solutions and recommendations, please check out the vegetable management guide. Um, if you prefer to um, use pesticides, the list is in there for all the different pests. So I encourage you all to check that out for the hottest recommendations. Of course, if you use pesticides, make sure you read the label always. And here's just some basic resources about um, high tunnel pest management in general. And please check out our high tunnel production uh, website. Uh, the High Tunnel Production Toolkit. We're adding new things on there um, monthly. And email me if you'd like to join our uh, email listserv, uh, Tunnel Vision listserv for high tunnel growers. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks to you both. Um, that was awesome. It looks like there was a few questions in the chat that you got to already. Um, and I'm going to um, hand it over to... Anne, thank you so much, Anne. Okay, so I'm just gonna touch on some of the diseases, disorders, catastrophes to watch out for. And I thought I'd throw this picture in because it's kind of appropriate right now. So uh, make sure your greenhouses are in well uh, braced for this next storm. It's always exciting, right? So basically, you know, all this early season stuff, a lot of the times it's abiotic, it's non-infectious. And a lot of times it's just plain old cold damage. And I just got a picture from a grower yesterday, a really purple tomato plant and uh, basically phosphorus um, uh, deficiency, like that picture on the right, you know, you get that purpling when you put your transplants into cold soil or you have cold temperatures, phosphorus doesn't move as quickly. And so you get that purpling. But the good thing about these abiotic problems is the plants grow out of it. So anytime you see a problem this time of year, um, always consider that it's it might be abiotic. And depending on how cold of soils you're putting your plants into, things may get shocked, they may sit still. But the important thing is always look at 
the root system first. Uh, and if the roots look good, then uh, always look at the new growth. And if the um, new growth looks good, that tells me that the plant's growing out of it. And uh, check and see if it's one age of tissue, because that's another good clue that it's abiotic. You know, it's cold, uh, like that picture on the left. It was cold when those first leaves, the lower leaves were coming out. And if you look at the top of the plant, things are coming out uh, green. That tells me there's a great root system in there pushing out new growth. So um, basically, always look at your root system and look at that new growth to see if it's growing out of it. And it's likely a, a, a cold damage. That picture in the middle, tomatoes do weird stuff with cold temperatures. I've seen like tan leaf spotting and damage like that. But again, look at that new growth. Always look at the root systems too. Anytime you see a problem in the upper part of the plant, it's probably related to something in the root system. So rule that out first. I don't know how many growers I talk to um, that are having a, a wilt issue in, in the top of the plant and they haven't looked at the roots yet. So always look at the root system. Make sure you're not seeing a root rot. The other early season problem uh, is ethylene damage and uh, tomatoes are like the canaries in the coal mine. And so it often happens when we think we're done heating for the season, but then you turn the heaters back on when we have a cold snap. And then there's either poor ventilation or a cracked heater and ethylene <clears throat> is released. And ethylene causes that curling and distortion. Like it looks like 2,4-D herbicide injury to me. And um, tomatoes are really susceptible. So the clues here would be that curling and twisting and the fact that you're seeing it probably pretty evenly across the whole crop, or it might be worse near uh, the uh, venting or near the heater. Um, so those are some things to look for. And again, the plants should grow out of it, but like that picture on the right, that's pretty severe. It's, you know, it may not grow out of it very well, you, or you may not have time for it to grow out all the way. Uh, but that ethylene damage can cause flower abortions, um, things like that. So if you see some that curling and twisting, especially in tomatoes, always check your heaters first. The other thing that's really common this time of year is edema, and that can be common in spinach, tomatoes, uh, ivy geranium, a lot of different plants. And basically it happens when we get cool, wet, conditions, cloudy conditions, you're watering along like you think it's gonna be sunny and warm. The plant takes up the water, it's cloudy and cool. So the plant, um, that uh, water builds up in the plant cells and it doesn't get transpired because the sun's not out. And so you get these corky lesions on the leaf undersides typically and often along the leaf veins. And it looks really bad and it looks like it happens all at once. And it looks like it might be spreading because it looks like it's getting worse. But again, check that new growth and the new growth should grow out fine, especially once the weather turns uh, warm and sunny. So none of these are real deal breakers. You know, it just looks bad and it's, um, but luckily they, they grow out of this stuff. This is what it looks like on spinach. That's pretty common in spinach this time of year. We actually looked at a sample last week with some edema on the leaf undersides, just those corky lesions. Just because it's hard to water this time of year, you don't know if it's gonna be 60 degrees or, or in a snowstorm and 20 degrees. The main uh, real infectious disease problem that can be an issue this time of year is damping off. And damping off is caused by four or five different soil-borne fungi and what you see in your flats is wilting, poor new growth, brown sloughing roots. Uh, like I said, four different uh, fungi, they all like cool, wet soils. And it can cause a rot in the root system uh, before um, the seed emerges or after the seedlings emerge. And really there's no good rescue for this. It's best to start over. So again, if you see that kind of a symptom in the uh, plant, always look at the root system. And if you see brown, uh, gross, slimy, sloughing off roots, that's probably damping off. So typically in soilless mixes, um, those are sterile. You wouldn't have these fungi, but if you're not using good sanitation, you know, you let a hose 
um, you store your hoses on the ground and then they hit the flats or you don't uh, uh, clean your flats at the beginning of the season, make sure all the soil's removed, um, damping off can really uh, become a problem. Also crown rots this time of year, you know, putting out uh, tomatoes in cold, wet soils. Um, sometimes the emitters are putting out too much water or it's too cold outside, but you get that, um, that crown rot right at the base of the plant. So if you see wilting plants in the greenhouse, especially tomatoes, always go over and look lower in the plant because oftentimes it's that rot right at the soil line. It almost looks like a rodent has been in there and fed on that um, the lower part of the plant, but that's typical for um, crown rot. Pull that out, get it out of there, and you can probably put another plant right back in there. But it's caused by those same different four or five different soil-borne fungi as the um, root rots. So managing damping off, basically what you want to do is use anything that you can promote rapid germination of seeds, whether it's um, you know heat mats, turning up the temperature, but you want those seeds out of the ground so they're not lingering in cold, wet soils. Always start with clean flats, no soil left on the trays, use bleach or hydrogen peroxide to disinfest the uh, flats. Um, avoid overwatering, especially when cool and cloudy, cloudy, Avoid overcrowding, you know, things get really crowded this time of year, but if they can't, if there's not good air circulation, those soils stay wetter and cooler. Um, so spread things out and also consider your soil mix. If you've got something really high in organic matter, that has a greater water holding capacity. So um, you may want to, you know, change your mix a little bit, make it a little bit lighter mix, not as much peat or whatever. Um, and then a lot of growers use uh, root shield, trichoderma fungus, and it basically competes with the bad fungi for sites on the roots. So that can, you know, a drench of, of root shield can help uh, in a lot of different cases. So, oh, and the other thing I was going to mention is, uh, you know, a few years ago, we got shipments, people got shipments of tomatoes, um, from other companies and they came in already infected with powdery mildew. And it was really hard. Growers, you know, when it, they show up that early with the disease, it's hard to keep on top of it and get it under control. So um, if you're buying in tomato transplants, um, make sure you really inspect them for powdery mildew because you don't want to introduce that into your high tunnel. Um, if you're producing your own tomato plants, this uh, pathogen will not live on dead tissue. It has to be on live tomatoes. So if you never overwinter your tomato plants, um, there should be no living powdery mildew that's in your greenhouse that's gonna attack your seedlings. It's only if it's brought in from outside. So yeah, just check, uh, check for powdery mildew. It's got that uh, distinctive white powdery coating likes high humidity, uh, cloudy conditions. So just a note, always check your transplants if you're buying in, in stuff. Make sure we don't have that happen like it did a few years ago. Uh, the other thing I'm hearing about from growers that's really common this time of year is on spinach, cladosporium leaf spot. It's a little tan leaf spot on spinach and then it gets an olive green center and uh, those are spores of the fungus and it's really common on fall and winter high tunnel spinach, uh, likes cool, wet conditions, high humidity, can grow at cool temperatures. And I don't know how you guys grow high tunnel spinach. It seems really hard because, you know, this time of year on the shoulder seasons, you're taking row covers on and off and you never know what the weather's gonna be exactly. But if you cover your plants with, uh, wet plants with row covers, you're asking for, uh, issues with this fungus disease. And the spores really easily spread. Um, so that's something I'm seeing a, a lot of. And there's really no good rescue for this. I talked to one grower uh, recently that uh, they decided they're just gonna cut the whole crop, get that disease tissue out of there and try to start over and uh, let it regenerate. And hopefully we've got sunnier, warmer weather and less 
fewer row cover um, use. Uh, the other thing, this disease can be seed borne. And I just also looked at a sample for another grower of spinach and we found verticillium in that. And that also can be seed borne. So I think if you're growing spinach, you should um, use uh, uh, either a chlorine bleach solution uh, to soak your seed for a certain length of time. I think I saw 60 minutes somewhere else, but soaking your seed in chlorine or doing hot water seed treatment is a great way to start out with your spinach seed. Um, the chlorine seems easier to me uh, than hot water seed treatment. You need good water baths and, temp and uh, thermometers. But that's something everybody should be using just so they start out with clean, disease-free seed from verticillium, cladosporium, and then another common fungal leaf spot called stemphilium. Uh, like I said, it's hard to rescue, till under infected crops, or cut them, get, the, get it out, try to regenerate healthier stuff. Always use drip irrigation on sunny days so the foliage dries uh, quickly managing row covers and ventilation so moisture doesn't build up, don't cover when they're wet, controlling weeds on the crop outside and the edge of tunnels to increase airflow, and then uh, looking for some varietal uh, resistance. There's, uh, there's some cultivars that are more resistant than others to the cladosporium. Winter Bloomsdale's more resistant than Ozark or Fall Green. So I think in the, the probably at um, when you're purchasing seed, they may talk about resistance to cladosporium. I'm not sure if it's actually listed. But I think that's, oh no, the other thing is uh, that I've been seeing on spinach that's really common this time of year. It's an abiotic issue and it's, uh, you know, it's part of the plant. They're glandular trichomes, which are just little plant hairs, but they can be really common this uh, time of year on spinach. And uh, some cultivars are more susceptible than other or have more of these trichomes, but it's really no, um, no real problem, but they can be sort of gritty. So I think that's my last slide. Yes, that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And yeah, um, we're happy to look at pictures first. And um, yeah, if I get uh, anything, any little insect, issue, especially from a commercial grower. Um, Margaret and Cheryl, I always have them take a look uh, because they they know their stuff. So, uh, but you're always welcome to send it to the clinic first. It's good that way because we log it into a national database and then, but I'll always get it down to Margaret and Cheryl. I had a question. Yeah. I put it in the chat, but I'll just ask it anyway. Yeah. So are leaves that have uh, edema, you showed a bunch of pictures, um, yeah. are they more susceptible to uh, disease? Even though I realize it's not a disease. And yeah, it's... well, I suppose they could be. I mean, there's a, there's a rupture in the plant tissue. So I suppose spores could get in there easier. I really haven't seen that. Because there's not, there aren't a lot of foliar issues that we're having this time of year uh, on new plants. You know, that's usually later in the season, mid-season. Um, so I usually just see it by itself. But yeah, that's, yeah, theoretically, yeah, it's a break in the tissue, so sure. And then I said some, I saw somebody said a, um, they use sous vide for, um, hot water treatment. And I, that reminds me, I got a good video from UMass on how to use sous vide for hot water seed treatment. And I'll post that. I meant to post it on the veg and berry listserv. So I will do that um, shortly because that's a sous vide is, um, a seems you can set the temperature and uh, seems like a great way to hot water treat seed. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. Um, there's another, well, there's one comment from Dale Isla Riggs about using row cover, sorry, netting to cover spinach instead of row cover and that cladosporium was reduced quite a bit on that. Yeah, anytime you can improve air circulation, you'll have fewer of these fungal diseases. Um, yeah, so if you can minimize covering your plants with row covers, uh, 
Yeah, that's a great way to avoid a lot of the fungal diseases. Yeah, and I think people have really backed off on row covers in the past couple of years, kind of figuring out what can survive without it and do okay. And just yeah. this management too. Yeah. Um, Heather's asking what causes the trichomes and if that's different from gutation crystals. Well, I th it is different from the gutation. So that can also be another little, um, that's a little uh, liquid that's emitted from a, a hydathode, a little um, specialized cell that uh, releases liquid. Yeah, they're different. The trichomes are um, you know, a part of the plant. It's a, a plant hair, so they are different. Some cultivars have more trichomes than others. Um, just same way with uh, tomato leaves too, right? Some are, are have many more trichomes and that helps with some insect damage. But, uh, and I don't know if they become more pronounced in, you know, with wetter conditions. I'm not sure what the deal is. But yeah, it's a matter of keeping track on the cultivars that um, produce the most trichomes, I think. Thanks, Anne. Um, any other questions? Pretty amazing um, panel of knowledge here. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, guys. That could have been an hour each. Huh. Well, it's much better to do it fast and furious. I was going to say, more less work for you, but thank you. That's such a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. You know, and I was, as I was looking on the um, website about the snow buildup on high tunnels, I didn't realize one of the recommendations, I guess, from Rimmel was to turn on the heat so it's at least 60 degrees inside, so the stuff melts off, which I thought, oh, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and inflation, too. I think between those two things, you can, like, really help shed yeah. snow, but yeah, Hopefully it's not too exciting of a storm for anybody. Right. So we actually just had the propane truck show up and we're like, fill everything. And the guy didn't have enough fuel. So that's oh, no. <laughs> an unexpected twist. But um, if we'll post presentations and recording and thank you all again so much. And um, we we have one more of these next week about the Veg and Berry Pick Your Own website, which is actually pretty interesting. Julie's here and she's going to be presenting on that. And it's a really great opportunity. So hope folks tune into that. And we'll call thank it you good. all. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody.